All right, turn with me, please, in your Bible to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. This is part three of our Wednesday night series on the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Galatians. Let me say at the beginning, if you missed the first two, there are videos on YouTube. If you'll just uh, go to YouTube and search for the free gift gospel mission, you'll be able to find them that way. And I do burn CDs upon request, and we don't charge you a dime for those CDs. Uh, so if you would uh, ever like a CD of a service, if you'll try to let me know immediately after that service is over with, uh, we'll try to get that to you while we're on the topic of CDs. Uh, I try to fill every request, but if you've requested a particular CD and you've not received that CD, uh, just give me a little reminder. Sometimes in the busyness in my schedule, I tend to let things slip. I wouldn't intentionally disregard your request, but if you'll just come and give me a gentle reminder, I'll try to get that taken care of for you. We left off last time with verse number 10, so let's start off tonight in the best place that I know for a man or a woman to look when we need to know the truth about how to live our lives and conduct ourselves in this world, the Word of God. We'll try to get through the rest of chapter 1 tonight if possible. Um, we know this letter is so rich that we could preach for weeks just using singular verses uh, from, this, from this letter. So if we do get through chapter 1 tonight, we'll be uh, moving at, light, at lightning speed. But uh, just to make sure we don't leave anyone in the dust, if you have a question, by all means, if you'll uh, ask the question, I'll do my very best to the ability that God has given me to answer that question for you. All right, beginning in verse number 10, Galatians chapter 1. Notice with me the Apostle Paul writing here says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he, boy I love this right here, <laughs> that he which persecuted us in times past <coughs> now preacheth the faith which he wants, which once he destroyed and they glorified God in me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, move in this service tonight. Open hearts, change lives, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated tonight. We've seen in the first two messages from this epistle to the Galatians that Paul is very passionate with what he has to say. He's not very happy. He, he's telling them off, basically. That's what's going on here. He's just letting them have it. Uh, false teachers are trying to influence the people that Paul has invested his teaching in. He's invested his love uh, in, and he's not a happy camper here. He admonishes the people by using military language that describes someone who has abandoned their post. But not only have they abandoned their post, but they did so quickly. They did so easily. He said, I believe it was in verse number 6, he said, I marvel 
that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God unto another gospel. So we see this going on today. This sort of thing still happens in, uh, in, in, uh, today in the uh, lives of many people. And uh, nothing is more disheartening that I could think of than for a preacher who uh, has these people that he's loved and he's cherished and he's taught them the truth just to have them turn away from that truth and abandon that truth and just forsake that without any resistance whatsoever. Amen? Amen. Uh, you know, and they just run off and they follow this false teaching and that's, that's a very disheartening thing for a preacher to consider. As a matter of fact, I can't think of anything that would be much more disheartening than maybe possibly somebody dying and going to hell. That was the state that Paul was in. Uh, so that's just a little bit of a review to the backdrop as uh, Paul pours his heart out here in this epistle to the churches of Galatia. Now, uh, as we move on into our verses tonight, it's been a couple of weeks since we've uh, hit on this series because of the January Jubilee, so I've had an extra week or so to think about these verses. I've taken the verses that we've read here tonight, I've laid them out in my mind. I've laid them out on paper. I've diagraphed them. I've asked the Lord to help me outline these verses for this message tonight. And here's what God gave me. I want to share this with you. We're going to look at, tonight at Paul's aim to persuade. We're going to look at the parallel of his past. We're going to look at Paul's appointed purpose. And then we're going to look at Paul's powerful preaching. Amen. First of all, Paul's uh, aim to persuade. In verses 10 through 12 here we see Paul uh, is writing to the, church of, the churches of Galatia and uh, he's telling them, I'm out to please God. I'm not concerned with pleasing men, but I'm out to please God. See, he's at the point in his life now, God is in control of his life. He's following after God and they, they had accused him of trying to please men, but he was in no way interested in pleasing men at this point in his life. He sought to please God, and he sought to please God alone. These false teachers were trying to undermine the Apostle Paul. They were trying to undermine his spiritual credentials, and they forced him into a place where he had to defend his ministry as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He says here, he says, For if I yet pleased men... See, what he's doing is he's acknowledging the fact that there was a point in my life where, yes, I did try to please men. But that's not the case anymore. He's saying, he's saying uh, 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 thank God, Jesus Christ has made a change in my life. Now he's saying, if I still sought to please men, then I can't be the servant of Jesus Christ. You see, when Paul persecuted the church, that was an effort to please men. Now, he might have thought that he was doing God a service. The Bible tells us that. But this persecution of Christians that Paul did, this was on behalf of his fellow Jews. But now, by the grace of God, Paul has become a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a willing slave. And being a willing slave for Jesus Christ, that resulted in quite a bit of suffering for Paul. Flip on over to Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 17. And he'll tell us a little bit about the suffering that he went through. Galatians uh, chapter 6 says, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Paul's telling them here, You might be accusing me of trying to please men instead of pleasing God, but look at this sacrifice. These marks that you see on my body, they didn't come by trying to please men, but I got these marks by seeking to please God. So Paul was a man who sought to please the Lord in his life. And that's what we need to seek after. That's what we need to seek after today. We need to have enough resolve in this world today uh, to stand and say, I don't care what this world may say. I'm going to serve God anyway. I'm not going to celebrate the homosexual agenda. I'm not going to sum submissively, uh, 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 you know, uh, accept Sharia law. I'm not going to stop praying whenever I want to and wherever I want to in the name of Jesus Christ. And we need to be willing to stand like the Apostle Paul stood and defend our ministries. Thank God. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, I know a little bit personally about what it's about uh, to... Uh, Defend a ministry. I've not suffered the kind of persecution that Paul suffered. I've not been beaten for my faith. I don't have marks on my body. 
But I've had them tell me, you ain't a preacher. Amen. God didn't call you to preach. You're not of God. You know what? I'll defend my ministry every time, just like Paul did. Amen. He told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He said, hey, though I labor more than they all, I, he knew where his help comes from. Amen. And we need to know where our help comes from today, and we need to stand. Uh, you know, a God-called preacher won't be preaching for worldly fame anyway. A God-called preacher is not going to care about the favor of men. He's going to seek to please God and uh, seek to do God's will, and he's going to give God's word. But you know what? That's not popular today. Many are persecuted for it. And others are falsely accused because of it. But if God be for us, who can be against us? I'm glad. Amen. Thank God that He's on our side tonight, church. Amen. He assured them that the gospel that He preached, He said, this gospel is not of men. This gospel that I preach is of God. We see this in verse number 11 where He says, but I certify you, brethren. You know, that's a very strong verb in the original Greek language. That was a verb that would introduce to an emphatic statement. Now, here's what Paul's emphatic, important statement was. He's saying, hey, this gospel, it's not of human origin. Amen. It's not of human origin at all. This gospel that I preach, it didn't originate with man because if it originated with man, it had the characteristics of every other religion. Yeah. Human works and pride and the devil's deception. Amen. But this gospel's not of men. This gospel's of God. Amen. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ that Christ came and died and rose again. Bless His name tonight. What He was doing here is He was contrasting the true gospel of Jesus Christ with the false teaching of the Judaizers who received their instruction from traditions. From traditions. Not, not even so much the Old Testament law but traditions about the Old Testament law. That's what's going on here. We cannot look to the traditions of men to gain knowledge about God Amen. and how we ought to live. You know what? Tradition still has a strong bearing in the church today. I'm sad to say that. We need to get out from under traditions of men. We need to lay those things aside and, and get back in this Bible right here. Get back in the Word of God. I'll just give you a couple examples of some traditions that we see today while we're on this. Some people have traditions when it comes to worship, when it's not really worship at all. Yeah. And they'll say unless you have a certain kind of music, you're wrong. Yep. God won't receive your worship. Right. When in reality, whatever glorifies God Amen. is good. It's a good thing if it glorifies God. Don't make no difference whether it's old, whether it's new. If it glorifies God, it's a good thing. We can't get caught up in traditions. That's false. God wants to be glorified, not limited. Amen. Well, another tradition is, well, <laughs> men, you ought to wear a suit and tie when you come to church on Sunday morning. There's not a verse in the Bible that substantiates this. Not a verse. That's a tradition. That's a tradition of men. Now, I wear a suit and tie many times, and I'm going to tell you why. This is why I wear a suit and tie. I, first of all, I'm not under the thumb of that tradition. I do that because that's what I want to wear. I believe that's modest apparel. I believe it shows reverence to God. Uh, and I've never told anybody in here that you have to wear a suit and tie on Sunday morning in order to be welcome in this church. Amen. Never once. But you know there's a lot of churches out there that do. Yeah. I've got a dear close family member who's been passed on that was uh, got caught up in something like that and uh, it didn't, didn't do no good at all. did a lot of harm because somebody said you've got to wear a suit and tie or you're not welcome here. I challenge anybody to find me a verse in the Bible that says anything about wearing a suit and tie. Amen. 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 That's just another example of tradition. But you know today we're seeing a shift in the opposite direction. Years ago, you know, it was... Uh, uh, the suit and tie that's been prevalent for preachers for years. But now, uh, you know, it's turning into the ripped blue jeans and the hoodie. God bless him. Or the Bermuda shorts and the Hawaiian shirt. These are some new traditions coming on. And I'm going to tell you, you know, if you, <laughs> it goes both ways. If you try to wear a suit and tie to a church like that, you'll be ostracized for it. You say, Pastor, that don't happen. I promise you it does. Amen. I've seen it. Look at that clown over wearing a suit and tie. Who does he think he is? It happens. These are all examples of traditions. 
when all the New Testament teaches is for Christian people to dress modestly, I don't think you ought to be showing off your body. Amen. I don't think you ought to be slouching around and dishonoring God. But listen, if all you've got to wear is old clothes that are ripped or torn and, and, and dirty, then praise God, you're welcome here. You come right on into this church and you worship God. Matter of fact, come right on up to the front, stand beside me. We'll lift our hands and praise God and worship God together. Amen. Amen. And uh, thank God, uh, you know, if anybody frowns at you or if anybody tries to deny you in any way, if you'll let me know, I'll guarantee you there'll be a conversation about that. But I don't think I'm ever going to have to worry about that happening because I've never seen that kind of spirit rear its ugly head in here because you're God's people and you've got the love of God in your heart and in your life and I thank God for you. Amen. But I want you to know I don't believe that's going to happen here. I don't know why I said all that but that's good. <laughs> These are examples of traditions. Paul was telling the Galatians what I preach comes from God but not from tradition. Here's the thing that most Jewish people had going on in Paul's day. They didn't study the actual scriptures. You know, that's a problem. Amen. They didn't study the actual scriptures, but they went by what men's interpretation of the scriptures was. And they used that as their authority. Not the actual scriptures, but what men had to say about the scriptures. That was their authority. Now here's the problem. These false teachers were the same way. They weren't given the truth of God's Word, but they were given men's false interpretation of God's Word. And the people were allowed themselves to be led away with this. And the thing about it is, these teachings actually contradicted the Word of God. Now we can't allow this to happen, but it happens today. Don't let this come into your life. We've got to hold up the Word of God as our infallible rule. We've got to hold up the Word of God as our authority today. You know, I keep reiterating that here at this church. You ought to read the Bible for yourself. Get in that Bible. Open it up and read it. Don't take my word for it. Don't take somebody else's word for it. You read the Scripture and you find out what it says. If you came to this church for the first time and I stood up on, uh, on uh, Sunday morning and I said, all right, everybody who wants to be saved, you walk down here to this altar, stand on one foot, hop up and down and dribble a basketball, and you'll be saved. No doubt somebody in this world somewhere would believe something like that because they didn't read the Bible. You've got to see what the Bible says. You know, I've dealt a lot with this business of salvation by water. They say, well, you, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to be baptized in water while some preacher says the name of Jesus Christ and they holler Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38. And then we'll say, they say, well, we believe that because that's what the apostles did. Well, the thing about it is, if you ask them if they, if they could provide one verse in the Bible Amen. where an apostle is quoted as saying the name of Jesus Christ in the water baptism, they can't find one. Amen. And you know why? Because it's not in there. Amen. Can't find them because I don't know what to believe. They'll go to these verses that say, well, they were baptized in the name of the Lord, or so-and-so was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But there's not one verse in this Bible that quotes an apostle saying the name of Jesus Christ while someone was baptized in water. Amen. Amen. Listen, we believe in Acts 2.38 of this church, yes. but we believe it rightly divided, and I refuse to build an entire false doctrine on one causal Greek preposition when the entire overwhelming evidence in the Scripture is that you're saved by grace through faith Amen. in the Lord Amen. Jesus. Amen. 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 Listen, you'll never be saved because somebody else said the name of Jesus Christ at your baptism. That's right. <laughs> You're saved when you invoke the name of Jesus Christ and His power and His authority, uh, amen, uh, by believing on Him to the saving of your soul. And here's the thing about it He gives you the faith to do that because salvation's of the Lord. Amen. Why am I talking about all this? Because these are similar examples of what Paul was talking about here, right here in the Word of God. Look at verse number 12. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. You know, when the Bible tells you that you are saved by grace through faith, but some other preacher tells you you're saved by doing something else, they're contradicting the Word of God, not preaching the Word of God. Amen. Amen. The word that we preach comes from the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, this word revelation of Jesus Christ is talking about an unveiling. Before Paul was saved, he knew about Jesus Christ, but he didn't know Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> but thank God one day he met him. Yeah. 
Yeah. One day he met him on the road to Damascus and he received the truth. There's many people today in this world who know about Jesus Christ, but they don't know Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of them have even attended church their whole life. They know about Jesus Christ, but they don't know Jesus Christ. Some of them are even leading worship today. Some of them are even deacons in churches. Some of them are even pastors preaching behind pulpits. They know about Jesus Christ, but they don't know Jesus Christ. <laughs> Thank God I, I'm, I'm glad in my life. For 26 years of my life, I knew about Jesus Christ. But I didn't know Jesus Christ. But thank God for the night I bowed a knee to Jesus Christ and I came to know Him. And when you know Jesus Christ, you want to know more about Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God made a change in Paul's life. He was no longer concerned about pleasing men, but only about pleasing the Lord. That ought to be your concern. Amen. But you know what? You can't do it if you're controlled by the flesh. Amen. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's why you've got to walk after the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Amen. They that are in the flesh cannot please the Lord. So that was the Paul's aim to persuade. Next I want to talk about the parallel of Paul's past. And I think we might end up having to make this a two-parter because I don't see us getting all the way through this tonight. <laughs> Let me read verses 13 and 14. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Do you see it there? You got your Bible open? You looking at the scripture as we read it? Yes. You see, this is where the Apostle Paul begins to lay out a sketch of his own life in order to further defend his apostleship and to prove to be true this gospel of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. He says to him, he said, you've heard of my conversion. He's talking about that system of works righteousness that was based on not just the Old Testament, but on men's interpretation of the Old Testament. You see, Paul didn't have a problem with the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, over the next chapter, in chapter 3, Paul said that he believed that a proper understanding of the Old Testament would lead one to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the salvation of God by grace through faith. Amen. Flip on over to the next chapter, Galatians chapter 3, verse number 6. I'm just going to read some of this here. This is good stuff right here. I hope you get a hold of this. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness... Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not, and all things that are written in the book of the law do them. <coughs> But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. I'd encourage you to go home and just finish reading the rest of chapter 3 when you get home tonight. Amen. This is where the apostle begins to lay everything out. This continues all the way through the end of chapter 3. And it's important too that we recognize that this book that I hold in my hand that I hope that you've got open in your lap or somewhere close to you tonight, this is all about God's grace from front to back, from cover to cover. Amen. Amen. Before Paul came to realize that salvation was by grace through faith, he persecuted the church. He persecuted them. Now, I'm not just talking about the kind of persecution that we talk about today. You know, we think 
somebody talks about us behind our, behind our back, we call that persecution. Hmm. Well, I was being persecuted. God help. Somebody talked about me. I was persecuted. We're not talking about the kind of persecution where, you know, some Christian is denied some privilege somewhere. We're not talking about that kind of persecution. Hey, uh, amen. This word persecuted here in verse number 13 speaks of the Apostle Paul's continual and persistent effort to exterminate Christians. That's the kind of persecution he was involved in. Let's look at some verses. Go with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And Saul was consenting unto his death. This is talking about Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, and I think and I hope everybody in here knows that Saul was Paul's name before he met Jesus Christ. Same person here. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Over in chapter 9 of the book of Acts. Flip over with me one more chapter. Saul again, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if any be, uh, if he found any of this way, those are followers of Jesus Christ, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. <coughs> Going to 1 Timothy now. Chapter number 1. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Verse number 12. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that He counted me faithful putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know, there are so many things that we can take away from these verses of Scripture tonight, but just let me approach it and put it to you like this. When you serve Jesus Christ and you do so wholeheartedly and you are sold out for the Lord, and you're following hard after Him, you're going to suffer persecution. You know, we haven't seen many people around our part of the world killed for their faith, but you know, that could very well soon begin to change. But when and if we see that day, because I believe the Lord could come back for us tonight, but when and if we see that day, we can have hope in knowing that we serve a God who is powerful enough to arrest the hearts of even the most wicked persecutors and transform them into powerful preachers of the grace of God and the love of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So, we just have to keep serving the Lord. We have to keep following Jesus. We have to keep preaching Jesus. There's nowhere to stop. There's nowhere to let down. There's nowhere to quit. There's nowhere to give up. Keep keeping on for God. Amen. In verse number 14, he says, And I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals. Hmm. You know, this is talking about how Paul was advanced far beyond his peers. How that Paul chopped ahead. How that he was at the head of the class. He was a bit of a trailblazer. He was the rising star of Judaism. And he saw Christians as obstacles in his way. And he sought to get rid of them. He sought to do away with them. Exterminate them. 
He would let nothing stand in his way. He was not only zealous in his beliefs, but the Bible says here that he was exceeding zealous. And it showed. You know, he talked about being exceeding zealous of the traditions of his fathers. It was speaking about a collection of Old Testament law teachings that were commonly referred to as the Halakha. Now, this is serious business. You don't, you, maybe you've never heard that word before. Don't worry about it. But this is serious business. I want you to know that tonight. These were interpretations of the law. And some of the Jews back in the time of the Apostle Paul, they perceived this interpretation of the law. I'm not talking about the law. I'm talking about the interpretation of the law. They looked at the interpretation of the law and they let that carry as much or more weight than what the Torah did. Let me give you this quote from John MacArthur about these traditions. I was reading this and this is what he said about it. Listen to this. He said it's regulations. Well, you're going to get a blessing out of this. I hope you're getting this. This is talking about these tr traditions that we're talking about here. He said it's regulations were so hopelessly complex and burdensome that even the most astute rabbinical scholars could not master it either by interpretation or conduct. He said it was so complex and burdensome that even the most astute scholar could not master it by interpretation or conduct. Don't you think Paul was glad when God opened his eyes to the grace of God? Yes. Thank God. Praise the Lord. I'm glad that our salvation doesn't come by some religious list of do's and don'ts. Thank God what people say about it. If that's what it took for me to be saved, I'd never be saved. You men have to wear a suit and tie. You have to shave your beard. You have to cut your hair. You have to let your hair grow long. You have to be baptized in water. You have to wear a suit while you're being baptized in water. Uh, you have to be baptized while you're shaving your beard. you got to wear a wedding ring. You can't go to the ball game. Uh, you can't be baptized at a ball game while wearing your wedding ring. Thank God I'm glad we don't have to keep up with all that. Christ died and set us free. Hallelujah. Well, thankfully, we're free. Amen. From these, these are traditions. I'm not talking to you about what the Bible actually does say. I'm talking about traditions. Men's interpretation of things falsely. We're free in Christ to walk in the Spirit and live by His grace. He purchased that for us when He came and died and rose again. Aren't you glad tonight? Amen. I'm happy about that. Well, we've talked about Paul's aim to persuade. We've talked about the parallel of his past. And I think that I'm going to start bringing it to a close here tonight. We'll come back next week. And we'll pick up here and talk about Paul's appointed purpose and Paul's powerful preaching. And I'll tell you, when you get into these scriptures and you begin to try to pull out everything that's being said here, you can't just go through this fast. Amen. Amen. You can't just move right on through here quickly. There's so much that needs to be addressed. There's so much that you want to be able to bring out and lay it out there and, and hope and pray that people will understand. Because God's Word is a rich Word. Amen. It's a powerful Word. There's a lot of good stuff in here. It's a deep Word. And God's Word has application for your life and mine. Somebody may say, Brother Byrne, what's the application for this message tonight? Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. Here's the first question I want to ask you tonight. Are you seeking to please God? Or are you seeking to please me? Pleasing God. Which one is it? That's the first thing I want to ask you. Because if you seek your favor from men in this world, you really need to reevaluate. Yes. Because seeking to please men is going to get you nowhere in eternity. But it's God who we need to please. Here's the second question I want to ask you tonight. Have you experienced a true change? Have you experienced a true change? Paul did. He met Jesus Christ and Christ made a change in his life. Yes, amen. There'll be a change in your life as a result of meeting Jesus Christ. We saw in the Bible the change that was made in Paul's life. And we read as he laid his life out there and he drew this parallel between his past and the persecutor and the blasphemer that he used to be and the new life that he has now in Christ. It was like day and night. 
we'll find out next week just exactly how radical of a change this was in Paul's life when we begin to read how that people began to hear how this great persecutor of the church has now been saved and he now preaches the faith that he once tore down and destroyed. And you know what? He said they glorified God in me. Hallelujah. Has Christ made a change in you? Has Christ made a change in you? Or are you still living the same old sinful life? Doing the same old sinful things. Saying the same old sinful words. Walking the same old walk. Never been a change. Never been a change. If you've not been changed, I've got news for you. You've not truly met Jesus. Because there's nothing or nobody that will ever be able to come into contact with Jesus Christ and leave His presence the same way they were when they come into it. That's right, amen. Nothing or nobody. Jesus Christ will change you. If you've not been changed by the Lord Jesus Christ, He can make a change in your life right now. You'll come to Him by faith. Somebody may want to do that. If that's you, why don't you come to Him? Why don't you come to the Lord right now? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, God, tonight.